Welcome to part three of our Supernatural Marriage Fast. This is started. I don't want to take too much of your time on this beautiful Tuesday uh, evening. God gave me a word of the Lord back in December of 2021, and he said that the year of 2022 is going to be the year of the bride. This is going to be the year of the bride. But he didn't just say that. He also said in the live that I did, that this was also going to be the year of the madman and there was going to be a lot of oppression on our on our men. I did not have a real revelation of what God meant by that until maybe just a few weeks ago. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I almost didn't even share the madman word of the Lord back in December because it just didn't make sense. How can I have such a strong word about marriages? And I'm the kind of prophet that does not prophesy marriages at all. Um, but then have this complete opposite of madman. I didn't really even know what madman meant at the time, but I released the word nonetheless because it doesn't really require me to understand it for me to release it. Uh, and then a few weeks ago, I, I understood because isn't it just like the enemy to take a, hear a word that God has given? This is the year of the bride, right? This is not a small thing. This is not a light thing. This is um, God saying that he's going to do something so supernatural through marriages that there's going to be an explosion of them. Well, isn't it just like the enemy who knows the true purpose of marriages, whether we understand and know them or not, the devil does, to say, you know what, since this is the year of the bride, I'm going to contend against that word and I'm going to make all of the men lose their minds this year, right? It just makes sense because the enemy, according to John 10 and 10, comes to steal comes to kill and comes to destroy, but God came that we may have life and have life more abundantly. And so uh, we all, uh, I have a ministry that God has gifted me called uh, Covered by God. And we all are a fasting and praying ministry. We're also a teaching and prophetic ministry. And we are fasting every single Tuesday, um, being charged by uh, the Spirit of God to fast every single Tuesday for the rest of this year from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. We're abstaining from all food from that period of time, drinking water only uh, to partner with God for this prophetic word, right? Because if God said it, that's what it is. We just have to align with that prophetic word. And contrary to what many believers think that we don't have any say, the Bible lets us know that history has always been shaped through the power of prayer and fasting. History has always been shaped through the power of prayer and fasting. You might not think that your fasting and prayers mean anything, but heaven knows and the devil knows. And so again, every single Tuesday for the rest of this year, we fast from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. PM. This is completely different from our fast that we do every, uh, we fast every month also the first three days of every month from six to six. This is not that fast. This is a completely different fast with a completely different purpose with completely different times. We are fasting from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. every single Tuesday for the rest of this year to partner with God with the prophetic word of this being the year of the bride. And we're doing it because covenant marriages is so important to God that the Bible not only starts with one in the book of Genesis, but the Bible ends with a marriage in the book of Revelation. As a matter of fact, the Bible lets us know that Jesus, his very first miracle that he ever performed was at a wedding ceremony, right? And so it is very, very, very important that we get this revelation of what marriage is. Um, what I do know for sure is that we are now learning what real covenant means and what God intended for marriages. And one of those things I believe God is doing in the year of 2022 with all of us is the power of agreement, right? The power of agreement is more of a weapon against the, um, against the kingdom of Satan than any of us will ever understand. And when you get married to your spouse, you immediately come into agreement where the two now become one. And anytime you two touch and agree, there is nothing that you won't be able to see manifest on earth as it already is in heaven because you guys have come into agreement with each other. Marriage is also the evidence that a curse has been broken over a land, a territory, or a region. You'll find this in the book of Je uh, Jeremiah 16, where God cursed this region 
And he said, proof of this curse is going to be that you're no longer going to hear the voice of the bride. You're no longer going to hear the voice of the bridegroom. You're no longer going to hear the voice of joy or the voice of mirth. So God not only cursed the land, but he said, the proof of the, the proof that I've cursed this land is that you're no longer going to hear wedding celebrations. Isn't that powerful to know that God silent, that, that the token of a curse was that there was no more marriages. I want you to look at your bloodline right now. And of course, this is not, you know, this is not everybody's testimony, but I want you to look at your bloodline right now. I want you to look at your family bloodline right now, right? Like, are the women married? Are the men married? Is there a heavy string of divorce on your bloodline? Um, is, is there a lot of late marriages in your bloodline? Look at your church. Look at your ministry, right? Is... Um, is there really just a slow, steady stream of marriages or are there no marriages? Well, you guys, this is indication that a curse is at work. This is very strong indication that a curse is actually at work. I wanted to read something to y'all. Okay. This is indication that a curse is actually at work, right? And then, but here's, here's the thing about God, right? God is such a sovereign God that over in the book of Je Jeremiah 33, when he redeemed the land, he said this land that was once desolate, so God had cursed it so much that not even an animal could live there. Not even a dog could live there. Right. And I want to look, I want you to, some of you to look at your wombs or those barren places in your life where nothing has survived. Nothing seems like it can grow any life there. Well, he said that this place that was once desolate, this place that was once like no life could live there. Not only am I restoring this place back, but I'm restoring it back. And the proof of my restoration on this place is the voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bride, the voice of the bridegroom, right? So the token, the evidence, the proof that God is restoring this place back to life again is him bringing back the voice of celebration concerning marriages, which lets us know that marriages is a lot more deeper than we have ever realized. It lets us know that this year that God says is the year of the bride lets us know that when he is restoring marriages back into the kingdom of God, the curse has been broken in our lives and our bloodlines in specific regions and territories and nations. Um, this is a lot more bigger than any of us thought. That's why I think that God is really um, dealing with us in the area of breaking ground, meaning breaking the evil covenants, breaking demonic altars and laying the foundation. And then we're going to build and plant because there's no point for you to be praying about your husband or your wife when you still have these faulty foundations that when these relationships come, you guys are going to, you know ruin it anyway. And so I think that for a very long time, we have not prioritized the the right things, the first things first, and we've kind of dived into things out of order. And we have seen the fruit of that in our lives. And God is such a sovereign and merciful God that he's allowing us to go back, correct the wrong, um, and propel us forward. One thing I want you all to know about restoration, and we're going to teach on this um, for the next fast for the next week. We're going to teach on restoration. But one thing I want you to keep in mind is whenever God is restoring a thing, the evidence of that restoration is speed. The evidence of restoration is speed. Okay. So you never have to feel, I know a lot of you over here are like maybe older and you feel like you've wasted a lot of time and you feel like you wish you had have known this information a lot sooner. And yeah, we can always look back in our life and say, you know, how guilty we feel that things haven't gone how we wanted it to go, but God is restoring you. Or in other words, he is speeding you up to where you should have been. So every year that you lost, because of the canker worm, the palmer worm, the locust stole that from you. And I want you to Google what a canker worm, palmer worm, and a locust does when it when it destroys something. Like these things are really, they like destroy stuff. You know what I'm saying? And so I want you to take a look at that. And he said, I'm going to restore those years that they stole from you. Or in other words, I'm going to speed these years up. But not only that, the word restore there, oh gosh, I just be going into places I just did not want to go into, but it's just so good. I got to go there for a second, one second. The word restore, when he said, I'm going to restore to you the years, 
that the canker worm and the palmer worm and the locust meant. I want you to know that that word restore literally means the covenant of peace. Okay. I want you to know that the word restore means a covenant of peace. We have been talking about covenants. Isn't it funny that when the pastor says, bring this woman to the altar and you guys are going to make a covenant of marriage, covenants are so much more powerful than you can ever. This restoration is a covenant that God has made with you. We talked about last week, and I'm going to remind you again, King David did not win that war against David because of some rocks and a slingshot. King David won that war against Goliath because of a covenant God had made with him. As a matter of fact, you'll find in the book of Jeremiah 33 that he told Jeremiah that if you can break the covenant I made with day and night, so can you break the covenant that I made with David. That's how certain, that's how sure, that's how permanent, that's how forever that covenant was, that if the covenant could be broken with a human being he made with David, a human being, he said, you will be able to break the covenant I made with day and the covenant by night. Hear the word of the Lord. If God can break this covenant of restoration he has made with you, then he can break the covenant with day and night. And we know that the covenant of day and night is not broken. That means that in the morning time, it's still going to be night. And it means that nighttime is going to be daytime because the covenant that he made of the order of the solar system has now been broken. It is in, God is not breaking his covenant with you. We break covenants. God does not break covenant. He is a covenant keeping God. It is impossible. So let me say this again. He said in Joel chapter two, verse 25, I will restore to you. This is why it's so important to study the Bible because this stuff is not just what we thought it was. We've been quoting this scripture all along thinking that this was a cute scripture, not knowing that if David was able to win against Goliath, not even the best warriors could win against Goliath, but this man that everybody thought was unskilled at war, that God had been training behind the scenes. This is for those of you that have thought that you've been hidden for years. This is for those of you that thought that God forgot about you and everybody else is well known. God want to kill that thing in you that want to be known anyway. But this is for those of you that God has been preparing in your secret place so that when the time comes, you're not going to win this thing because of the weapons you have. You're going to win it because of the covenant that God made with you. Joel 2.25 is a covenant that God made with you. He said, I will restore covenant. I will restore speed. I will restore what takes people 10 years to do. You're going to get done in one. I will restore what takes people a month to do. You're going to get done in a day. I will restore. Yeah, you might not have anybody in your life that is considering you for marriage. But when God restores you, you will meet somebody this month. You will meet somebody next month and you will get married to that person in 30 days. That is what supernatural restoration means. That is what it means when the hand of God is on your life. Well, Tiffany, don't you think that's too soon? Well, we know people that have waited 10 years to get married only to get a divorce a year after they got married. When the hand of God is on your life, when the hand of God is moving the spirit of restoration on your life, you will get married to somebody in 30 days and stay married to that person for 300 years. That's just how God works. I will restore to you the years, the years. How many years have you allowed the canker worm, the palmer worm or the locust to steal from you? How many years have you allowed, Tiffany, what's the canker worm, the palmer worm, and the locust? That man that you wasn't supposed to be having sex with, that woman that you wasn't supposed to be having sex with, those relationships that you know good and well you shouldn't have gotten into, um, that have now created an anti-marriage um, spirit to run rampant in your bloodline, that has allowed um, the spirit of divorce to run rampant in that Jezebelic spirit that runs in all the women that emasculate the men in your bloodline, that adulterous spirit that run rampant in all the men in your bloodline, they just cheat on their wives all the time. That has not opened up a covenant of death over your bloodline and anti-marriage spirits. What is that? The canker worm and the palmer worm and the locust. What does that look like? That abortion spirit that maybe you haven't had an abortion, but your great, 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 great grandmother had an abortion. And now the blood of that baby is crying out against you and your bloodline that oh, those abortions that your grandfather made all of his mistresses get. And now those bloods are crying out from the blood against you. Y'all, do y'all know when somebody dies, that, that person's blood is 
crying out from the ground against you and your children and your bloodline and everything that you touch until somebody that raises up in your bloodline, which is you, which is me. Until somebody raises up, and I'm not talking about somebody that just knows the word and been preaching the word and getting church and shout. I'm talking about somebody that has a knowledge of the word of God that can reverse these curses on your bloodline. The Bible says the just shall be delivered by knowledge. Through knowledge shall the, the just be delivered. Deliverance comes from what you know. This is why the Bible says my people are destroyed because they lack knowledge. And so it takes somebody like you, according to Isaiah 58. This is why we're fasting. Isaiah 58 is your principal scripture of fasting. He says in the book of Isaiah 58, you will be known as the repairer of the breach. What is a breach? A breach is a break in a contract. Somebody in your bloodline has breached or in other words, broken the contract that they were supposed to have made with God, likely through idolatry, likely through murder, likely through incest, molest, whatever that, that thing is, right? Now you come along with this knowledge that you now know about. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be, you know what I'm saying? It's a miracle that I'm here before you right now preaching the good news of Jesus Christ because Lord knows I was a thought, you know what I'm saying? But the, what I'm trying to say to you is God is using people like me, people like you as a sign, miracle, and a wonder. We are people that came from the streets. We are people that came from the hood. We are people that came from not in the church, that study the word of God, that is able to take what we know. And not only am I a repairer of the breach in my bloodline, I'm a repairer of the breach in my generation. This is why many of you are on this live right now, did not come up in church, did not come from a saved family. And now God is teaching you the principles of scripture that you can now take and not just repair your bloodline and your children, but repair your generation. Hear what I am saying to you. We are the generation that will serve God. We are the generation that is putting God back in his rightful place in our life and our nation. And we are giving God the rule, the reign and the dominion back over our bloodline. Pop, I'm over here preaching a very good message. I will restore to you the years. I will restore to you. Rest restoration is a covenant that God has made with you. What does that look like, Tiffany? What does that mean? That means that when God, when you're fighting against the enemy and it looks like everything is being delayed and it looks like everything is being hindered, it means that you say, you know what? I'm not actually going to fight against you. I'm going to allow the covenant that God made with me to fight against you because God is a covenant keeping God. When God makes an oath with you, when he makes a promise, with you when he makes a vow with you the word keeping means he now has guardianship over that he has custody over it he is now watching over it to fight against anything that is fighting against you he's a covenant keeping god the word cov the word restoration in joel 2 25 means to be uh it means a covenant of peace i want you to study that you will also find the covenant of peace in ezekiel 37 when ezekiel was sent to uh, by the spirit of god sent to the valley of dry bones and he was sent to raise up that valley of dry bones when when you get to the bottom of that chapter you will read about the covenant of peace god shares with you what that means right um, the covenant of peace also means to live in peace, which means that your marriage that God is restoring, you will not have a marriage like other people's marriages are. Your marriage will be exemplary. Your marriage will be extraordinary. I don't care what people say, you know, marriage is not easy. Marriage is hard. Speak for yourself because my marriage has a covenant of peace with it, which means that I will live in peace with my spouse. I will live in peace with my husband. My husband and I will have the best, best friendship that anybody has ever seen. We will have an exemplary marriage. We will have a quarreling free marriage. We will have a fighting free marriage, right? You want to confess these things over your life according to the covenant of peace that God has made with you. What everybody else's marriage looks like will not be your testimony. Your marriage will be a sign, a miracle, and a wonder. It will be said that you will never argue. It will be said that you and your husband, you and your wife spend all of your time together and want to spend more time together because you are absolutely in love with each other more than anybody has ever seen. God is raising up testimonies in this hour. You will be marked by miracles in your marriage. Testify about that. The word restoration also means... 
to be uninjured. You will not be um, uh, injured by a polygamous spirit. You won't be injured by any witchcraft or prophetic witchcraft prayers uh, that people throw your way. You won't be injured by any of that stuff because the covenant of restoration that God made with you is on your life. The Bible says that the book, the word restoration also means to make safe. It means to make compensation. It means recompense or reward. It means, um, y'all can read up on this on your own, but you know what I'm saying? It means all the good things that we need the covenant of peace to mean on our marriage, right? And so, um, again, marriage means that, you know, the curse has been broken, but I also wanted to show you evidence. So y'all write all this stuff down. You're going to be reading Joel 2.25. You're going to study the covenant peace. You're going to read Ex Ezekiel 37. Um, and the reason I want you to read that is because we're in resurrection month anyway. You need to be studying about the dead coming back to life again. This is what this whole month is about. Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection. He is he specializes in making dead things come back to life again. It doesn't matter what it looks like, including your love life. He's, this is God's specialty, right? Um, I want you to read that. And then I also want you to read 1 Kings 18, because all the way at the bottom, after prophet Elijah kills and destroys those demonic altars and erects an altar unto God, the Bible says that the hand of the Lord was on Elijah and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. I need you to know that when he ran ahead of um, Ahab, Ahab was already there. Like Ahab had already started on his journey to Jezreel. Let me see how many days he had been. One second. Okay. This was a 14 mile cross country run that prophet Elijah ran. And the reason why it was supernatural is because Ahab had a head start. So after God had restored him, after the curse was broken by evidence of the sound of the abundance of rain, the Bible says that the hand of the Lord was upon prophet Elijah. He girded up his loins and he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. That is restoration. I prophesy to you today that because you have been faithful to the sacrifice of fasting and prayer, because you have been faithful to the killing of your flesh and laying down every idol before God, that the reward you will get for what you are doing in secret. Remember, when we fast, we fast in secret. You're not promoting it on social media. I have to do it, obviously, because this is a corporate fast. You can also let people know about it only for the purpose of inviting them to the fast, but you do not want to be promoting that you are fasting. You don't want to be telling people you are fasting because God says that that is the only reward that you're going to get. What we want is what we do in private. God rewards us openly. I prophesy to you today that because of your obedience to this marriage fast, because of your faithfulness with partnering with God for this prophetic word to come to pass, God is restoring your marriage. God is restoring your hope. God is restoring your broken heart. And the evidence of this restoration is a speed on your life. I don't care what it looks like right now. Our new season is not seen. It is proclaimed out of our mouth. I'll say it again. Our new season is not seen. It is proclaimed. We are going to prophesy that thing out of our mouth. One thing I love about scripture is um, it lets us know in the book of Genesis that the spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, who we meet in the book of Acts, we, we actually find out in the book of Genesis that the spirit of God, according to Genesis chapter two, was brooding over the earth, right? The Holy Ghost was already there, which lets us know that the power and the presence of God was there, but we didn't see anything created until God said, let there be. Hear what I'm saying to you. For those of you that do not think that you need to partner with God to watch things come to pass, for those of you that think that God is just going to do what he wants to do and we are just mere humans and he does not need us to do anything. The Bible says that the spirit of God brooded over everything, but we didn't see anything created until God spoke and said, let there be, which means that you can house the presence and the power of God and still see nothing created in your life until you speak that thing. So we are partnering with God to make sure that these things come to pass again. According to scripture, we see all throughout the Bible 
where, um, where fasting and prayer shifted the course of history, shifted the course of nations, completely stopped whole groups of people from being exterminated and murdered um, because of evil uh, proclamations and announcements and decrees made by kings, right? Somebody asked me for the scripture one second. Let me get it for you. This is... Uh, I didn't have it written down. Sorry. One second. Okay. It is Genesis chapter one, verses two and three. The Bible says, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God, which we didn't think the Holy Ghost. Well, I didn't think the Holy Ghost was here until the book of Acts. The Bible says, and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters Verse three, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good and God divided the light from darkness. And then God called the light day and the darkness he called night uh -huh. and the evening and the morning were the first day. And then God said, let there be firmament in the midst of waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. God made the firmament and divided the waters. So um, this lets us know again in Genesis chapter one, verse two, that the spirit of God was there, which means the power and presence of God was there, but nothing was created until God said, let there be. You'll find that in Genesis chapter one, verses two and three, write that down as well as a part of your uh, learning. Okay. Uh, I get a few inboxes and, uh, People are emailing me, asking me, Tiffany, how do I break curses? How do I destroy altars, et cetera? You guys, I, I, I want you to go and watch my YouTube video called The Art of War. And then I want you to watch my YouTube called Covenant of Peace. Minister uh, Kevin Ewing has done a fantastic job uh, through the power of the Holy Ghost teaching these lessons. I believe that when you watch these two videos this week, you won't have any more questions on how to break curses, how to come out. of. And for those of you, and let me just say this because there's so many people that watch my lives and I do know that we have differing of opinions. Uh, many people have been telling other people, well, there's no such thing as curses. We live under grace. Um, this is false teaching. We do not live under this. This is condemnation. This is not. Okay. And I understand that you feel that way, but this is what I want to tell you. And you can fight against scripture and not against me. In the book of Deuteronomy, right? In the book of Deuteronomy, there is a curse of inflammation. And this is the only example I ever want to give because we can't argue with, none of us can argue with this. I have a lot of, I have a, a whole nother list of proof that I can give you, but we cannot argue that the curse of inflammation, according to the book of Deuteronomy, it literally says it's a curse. That inflammation in the Bible is a curse. If curses did not still exist anymore, why does anybody have inflammation today? If curses do not exist anymore, inflammation should not exist in any believer's body this day and age. If curses did not exist, none of you should have arthritis. None of you should have anything that uh, inflammation in the body could give. None of you should have it. If that is the case, that means that an Old Testament curse is still active today. And there's a reason for that. So instead of fighting me, because whether you live with the curse or not, is not my, it has nothing to do with me because I'm over here doing my work. You know what I'm saying? I'm just trying to get you free. But what is the harm of you going in to break these curses? What is the harm of you going in and breaking these curses? What is the harm in it? You see what I'm saying? So again, we are fasting every single Tuesday, all of 2022 from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, and we pray corporately at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on this YouTube channel. Please, everybody, make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel. And, um, and we are really getting busy breaking ground and laying foundation so that when we build and plant, it's going to go, it's going to be so quick, y'all. It's not even going to be funny. Today's, um, today's 
prayer is a 911 emergency prayer for men. I actually had a completely different message scheduled out, but as uh, I was up until two o'clock in the morning with the Holy Ghost dealing with me heavily on the spirit of madman, which is actually trying its best to increase in the life of our men. Just a few weeks ago on my Instagram stories, I had written a story warning people. I said, listen, do not, when you go out in traffic, do not argue with people. If somebody cuts you off in traffic, just smile and wave, let them go. I don't care if you deal with road rage, ask God to help you with that. If somebody cuts you off in the grocery store, whatever it is, smile and wave. Do not argue with people. People are losing their minds. I'm telling you what I saw by the spirit of God. Well, it was not 24 hours later that I saw on my Facebook page, somebody right here in the city that I live in, um, this woman cut somebody off, this older woman cut somebody off in traffic, and this young girl came out of her car and shot that lady in her head, and that lady died. Um, this is just a couple of weeks ago. And after she shot the lady in her head, she was like, oh my gosh, I didn't mean to kill her. I didn't mean to shoot her. Like She was just you know, flexing her muscle, I guess. But what I'm trying to say is, I saw that right after I released that warning, right? Hear what I'm saying to you. Hear what I'm saying to you. Um, I have another good friend of mine. Her, her cousin was murdered at her job. This is just last month. I said, how was she murdered at her job? Well, her boyfriend, who she had just broken up with, that she told she didn't want to be with anymore, uh, had just gotten out of jail obviously did not want her broken up with him. They were pretty good friends. They co-parented very well. They weren't beefing with each other. He came to her job, told her to come down. He had some food for her. She came down from her job to pick up her food. He shot her in her face over and over and over again, which means that the other people that were on break saw it and the people that were inside the building could not come out of the building because there was a dead body at the door. Um, this was my good friend's cousin that this just happened to. He was arrested for doing that. And all he kept saying was, I don't, I don't think I did that. I loved her. I don't think I did that. I loved her. I don't think I, I would have never did that to her. That wasn't me that did that to her. If that's not a madman, I don't know what is. Um, just back in December, um, I, I watched on Facebook, unfortunately, uh, it's actually one of my followers got gunned down by her children's father. He had went and killed his first baby mother, and then he came over to her house. Went, he went live on Facebook, and he killed her live on Facebook, one of my followers, back in December. Um, I watched last night a man... I watched his interview last night. He, he snapped and killed his girlfriend. He was getting ready to shoot her dog in the head and the girlfriend told him just do to her what he's getting ready to do to the dog. And he said, okay. And he shot her, he killed her dad. Then he went over to his stepfather's house because the stepfather uh, wouldn't give him any money. He killed him and then found out that he had $20,000. And he was like, well, I'm glad I killed you because all I needed was $1,000 and you wouldn't even give me $20,000. I mean, you had $20,000. Like you tried to play me. I don't like that you lied to me. Like he's telling this to the dead body. His cousin comes downstairs to see that the, the stepfather is dead. He's like, yo, what did you do? And he's like, well, I just went ahead and killed him because he was asking too many questions. The man says that if he did not, if the police had not caught him, he was just going to go and just kill everybody else he had beef with. That's what he said. I watched the whole interview. I just sat there and watched it. He said he had no remorse. And he said, as a matter of fact, the girl, his girlfriend's mother came to the house a day after he killed her. And he said her mother... He said, what kind of mother is that? She, did, she didn't even come check on her child. She wouldn't even come in the house to check on her daughter. What kind of mother is that? And I said, that was a mother that had the Holy Ghost because it was only the spirit of God that told that mother not to go in that house and check on her daughter because she was next because that spirit on the inside of that man wanted to kill that mother too. That's why I'm convinced that mother had the Holy Ghost and she didn't go inside the house. And despite that, that mother, that man set the house on fire and, and set that woman's daughter on fire. This just happened. 
He kept saying he snapped. That's the word he kept using. He kept saying that he snapped. Hear me clearly, y'all. We are going to pray that these men snap back. That is what we're going to pray. What I also noticed he said in the interview since I sat there and watched it all was that his dad, when he was a little boy, he watched his father shoot his mother multiple times trying to kill her, but his mother didn't die. His father spent 15 years in prison because of that. His mother shot his, his father, I'm sorry, shot his mother multiple times over and over and over again. And um, his mother survived that, but his father went to jail for the, you know, for about 15 years. Which means that we know that this is a spirit, obviously. He did not care. He had absolutely no remorse for the death. He was like, it doesn't matter. I, I don't care about none of this. None of this matters. And the only thing I kept hearing him say over and over again was that he snapped. And so we are going to pray that these men snap back. I want you to go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14. It says, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Eve, uh, the spirit of the Lord departed or is departing from these men and the evil spirit from the Lord is troubling them. Hear what I'm saying to you. For those of you that are like Tiffany Wise, it's happening because you're going to see men, this happen to ministers. You're going to see this happen to men and women of God. You're going to try to figure out what is happening. I'm telling you, y'all, don't judge this by appearance. Judge this righteously. Whatever you see from this moment forward, I am warning you by the spirit of God. Do not think of anything that you see anymore from your carnal mind or from your flesh. I want you to be looking at everything you see from this moment forward from the spirit of God. The Bible lets us know, don't judge anything according to appearance, but judge according to righteous judgment. As people of God, we are supposed to be judging matters. We are supposed to be judging. I think we just haven't done a real study on bad judging and godly judging. But please do not, if anytime you say out of your mouth, well, I just feel like <clears throat> wrong already. You already are in your flesh. You are, anytime you say out of your mouth what you feel like because you saw something, because you judged something, because you didn't like what somebody said or how they said it, or you didn't like what you saw, you come to your own conclusion. Anytime you say out your mouth, well, I just feel like I want you to know that your flesh is now telling you what you should think. It's a spirit of error likely behind what you've discerned and it is not God. When the Bible says to judge according to appearance, uh, don't judge according to appearance, but judge according to righteous judgment. That means that as soon as we see something with our natural eye, as soon as you start seeing men and women of God killing themselves, because that's what's coming up next. And this is why these people have walked away from God and God is killing your idols. I heard God say, and I'll keep repeating it. God is coming after our idols this year. What God has shown me is so, is so disastrous. What God has shown me about idolatry and him coming after our idols, me included, right? It's so damning. It's so scary that every single day, what I have seen in the realm of the spirit coming to this earth this year because of idolatrous worship, Hear what I am saying to you by the spirit of God. Every single day I wake up, maybe three times a day, I am destroying any idol in my heart, any, anything in my heart that I think has come up as an idol against God. I am in prayer destroying it because I have seen people this year dropping dead. God is coming after your idols. God is coming after your idols. Hear what I'm saying to you by the spirit of God. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and the evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. The word evil here means giving pain. It means unhappiness. It means misery. It means sad. It means unkind of a vicious disposition. Some of us don't even need the gift of discerning of spirits to see a certain disposition on a man or a woman, right? 
Evil means wicked in thought, deed, and action. It also means sorrow, grief, and being heavy. These are the Hebrew definitions of the word evil. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14. Now, everything you read in the Old Testament is the Hebrew definition. And everything you read in the New Testament is the Greek definition. I personally like to look up definitions of words because it gives me a better understanding and a better revelation of what it means. For instance, if I thought and saw the word evil spirit, obviously I'm just going to think evil spirit. But when I look up the Hebrew definition in a concordance, you guys can just grab any concordance. But when I look up the word evil and I see that it means giving pain, unhappiness, misery, sad, unkind with a vicious disposition, wickedness and thought, deed and action, sorrow, grief and heavy... I never equated these things to an evil spirit, but this is according to scripture. When the Bible says this evil spirit troubled him, the definition of the word troubled him means it fell upon him. It means he was overtaken by sudden terror and it means the spirit of fear has come upon this man. Any of you that are dealing with a spirit of torment, dealing with a spirit of fear is being troubled by an evil spirit. Now you may say, well, Tiff, God puts evil spirits on people. No, I don't know. I don't know. But what I do know for sure is that God withdrew his hand of protection and he allowed it to come upon him. God has withdrawn his hand of protection from many of these people that we see losing their mind and he allowed it to happen. Why would God do that? Why would such a loving God, this God of love that y'all keep talking about, who's also a God of war, who's also a God of judgment and justice. Nobody likes to talk about that God. We just like to focus on the God of love and your perverted perspective of what you think love is because love is also correction, even when your flesh don't like to be corrected. You can lose your spiritual protection from God. We are, we are all susceptible to losing this spiritual protection. And when you lose this spiritual protection, Satan is eager to fill that void with something else. Tiffany, how do you know that Satan likes to fill the void with something else? Go with me to Matthew chapter 12, verses 40 through, 43 through 45. The Bible says, when an unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and he finds none. Then he says, I will return to the house from whence I came. And when he is come, he finds it empty, swept and garnished because the spirit of God is not there no more. Verse 45, then goeth he and he taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. He took seven other spirits that are more wicked than himself. More evil is another definition of more wicked. So when God withdraws a hand of protection from your life, it allows this spirit with seven more evil spirits, more wicked than before to fill that void because now you're swept empty. This is why we need the continual presence of the Holy Ghost in our lives. This is what Matthew 25 talks about with the wise virgins and the foolish virgins. The wise virgins kept a continual presence of the Holy Ghost. They kept their lamp trimmed. They kept their lamp filled with oil. The other ones didn't keep it filled. We need a continual presence of the Holy Ghost at all times. This is why we want the fire on our altar to never burn out. This is a day and age where it's every man for themselves. I cannot help y'all. This is every man for themselves. I'm somewhere at my altar I'm like, forget and make, make me an altar. You know, Saul at one time, the Bible lets us know that this man at one time housed the spirit of God on the inside of him, but pride, it is the spirit of pride that is the downfall of this madman thing that we are seeing, this madman epidemic that we are seeing right now in this world, the, the root of this is the spirit of pride. Saul at one time had the spirit of God on the inside of him, but because of his pride, because of his rebellion against God, and because of his desire to resist the Holy Ghost, that's what allowed this um, spirit to come upon him. Hear me when I say this very clearly. To disobey God, and this, this is for you and me, whoever this applies to, hear what I'm saying. 
To disobey God is to not want God in your life and God will give you what you want. To disobey God is you saying, I don't want you, I don't need you in my life. To say out of your mouth, God told you to do something and you don't do it is to say, I have no fear of God. You fear COVID-19 more than you fear the only true and living God. You had more awe of Corona, who's by definition name was King. I'm sorry, Crown. Corona, by definition, literally means crown. This thing came and swept the earth, shut the globe down, crowned itself king, and you bowed down to it in awe, or in other words, in fear of it. You obeyed Corona before you obeyed God. The Bible says, well, I don't know what the Bible says about Corona, but what I know is, to disobey God is literally you telling God, I don't need you. I don't need your help. I'm going to do things my way. And God will give you what you want. God will give you what you want. Well, Tiffany, what about delayed disobedience? Well, delayed disobedience is still disobedience. We, If any of you are in any type of delayed disobedience, God is merciful. God is... I, I don't preach about a, con a condemning God. I'm just trying to let you know why your life is what it is right now. There's a reason for it. But we have a very merciful God that all you have to do right now after this live is go and repent and say, God, I have been. Do you know the Greek definition of the word disobedience literally means to be a disbeliever in Christ? It literally means to be a disbeliever in Christ. The word Disobedient literally means it broken down and it's very root form of that word means to be a disbeliever in Christ. That's what you're saying when you disobey God. Many of you think that you'll have more fun when you disobey God. You, you, you have it better this way. But what you don't know is when you disobey God, you have opened up the door to this evil spirit troubling you. And what I love about a merciful God is that even though Saul was in a position of disobedience, he was still not too far gone to receive repentance and restoration on his life. This is what makes that so powerful. Today, Saul would have been classified as having a mental illness. But according to scripture, this was not a mental illness. This was indeed the proof of uh, a, a spiritual attack on his life because of something he had done. This goes to what I, I've always stood on the fact that I believe many of you have gone crazy, lost your mind, deal with mental illness because you have been disobedient to God. And the second you obey God is the second your right mind to come back to you. This is for all of you who are dealing with double-mindedness, the spirit of schizophrenia, you have been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, things of that nature. You may have a bloodline that has completely turned from God, did your own thing, didn't think you had to obey God, and now your bloodline or you is suffering the consequences of that. But I believe, um, that's what I believe. Let me also just show this to you. And I know I'm in the Old Testament a lot, but I did show you New Testament scripture of how this still applies then, Right. Um, this still applies then, but Ezekiel 14, I think is so powerful. And this is why I'm always praying against idolatry. It says, this is Ezekiel 14 chapter uh, verses three through four, Ezekiel 14 verses three through four. He says, son of man, these men have set up idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of, of at all by them? Therefore, hear what I'm saying to y'all. Therefore, speak unto them and say unto them, thus saith the Lord of, thus saith the Lord God, every man of the house of Israel that setteth up idols in his heart and puts the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet. This is those of you that won't release your idol out of your heart and you go to a prophet. The Bible says, I, the Lord will answer him that cometh according to the multitudes of his idols. God said, I'm going to answer you according to the multitude. I'm going to give you what you want. That is your punishment. Therefore, I say unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, repent, 
turn yourselves from your idols and turn away your face from all your abominations. So I just want to pray right now. Um, I want to pray right now over our men. I really feel like this is a 911 prayer. I had a completely different message, but I just let's just go ahead and pray for our men right now. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father. We glorify you. You are worthy of all of our praise. We thank you, God, for the for the people that have joined us in this fast, all on one accord, Father, to contend with the prophetic word that you've given to us. Holy Ghost, have your way in this life. Have your way throughout this fast, Father. I pray, God, that the spirit of the only true and living God is marked by signs, miracles, and wonders in our life. Father, I pray, God, that you are dealing with the enemies of our soul, Father. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ that anything that would be a hindrance to our prayer today, God, you would destroy it by the fire of God. Father, we forgive anybody for anything that they've done to us, God. I want everybody right now to forgive. We don't go into a time of prayer without forgiving. We want to take away any stumbling block of our prayers being um, hindered or answered. Father, in the name of Jesus, we forgive. You might want to name them. I named all the people I needed to forgive this morning. Father, we forgive everybody for whatever they've done to us. We are, we are understanding now through the revelation knowledge that forgiveness is not a feeling, but forgiveness is a decision that we have made. So Father, we make a decision to forgive these people for the most atrocious acts that they have done to us, for the most betraying acts that they have done to us, Father. We forgive them by the mercies of God. And Father, we uproot them out of our hearts, God. Every root of bitterness that have set in our heart because of unforgiveness, all that pain in our backs, God, our shoulders, any pain in the cells of our bodies because of unforgiveness, Father, anything that has now created a rebellious cell that has turned into cancer because of unforgiveness, Father, reverse these curses, reverse the spirit of infirmity, Father. We forgive these people in the name of Jesus Christ and we release them now to the, uh, uh, we release them, God, by faith back to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And now we ask, Father, that you help us to forgive ourselves. We forgive ourselves, God, for disobeying you. We forgive ourselves for being hypocrites. We forgive ourselves for judging by appearance and not according to righteous judgment, Father. Forgive us, Father, for putting our mouths on people that your hand was on. Forgive us, Father, for judging people and then setting a curse on our lives. Forgive us, Father, for putting our tongue against, against your people, Father. And now our tongues have been condemned according to Isaiah 54. Father, we ask that you forgive us now in the name of Jesus Christ. And by faith, we receive your forgiveness. We plead the blood of Jesus Christ over this stuff. We declare, Father, that you do not remember it anymore and neither do we remember it either. Father, I come to you. You gave us a word that this was a year of the madman. And we declare, Father, that these men that belong to us, we are the repairers of the breach. These men that belong to us in our bloodlines, these men that are supposed to take their rightful place back into the kingdom of God. Father, these men that the enemy has scheduled to snap, we declare in the name of Jesus Christ that they will snap back. I want y'all to open up your mouths. I want you to pray right now in the name of Jesus over your fathers, over your sons, over your husbands over your uh, husbands to be men pray over yourselves pray over your sons that are coming pray over your cousins pray over your uncles father in the name of jesus we declare that these men snap back now in the name of jesus christ we declare god that their minds snap back we declare father that their thoughts snap back father in the name of jesus christ let their vision snap back let their perception and how they perceive things let it snap back in the name of jesus christ let their eyes snap back father in the name of jesus christ we declare that their hearts snap back from a heart and heart we declare that their heart snap back father from a hardened heart in the name of jesus christ father let their hearing snap back every spirit of leviathan god that has their hands over their ears that when we say something to them god they hear something different let their hearing snap back back in the name of Jesus Christ, Father. Let the emotions of these men snap back in the name of Jesus. Every emotion of sorrow, every emotion of suicide, God, every emotion of hating women, Father, every emotion of hating the world, every emotion of these men that think that they nobody understands them, snap back in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I command that the will of these men snap back. 
We declare, Father, that their will now lines up with you, Father. We pray that even right now as we are praying that these men have an encounter with you right now, God, in their cars, in their houses, at their jobs, Father, in the airplane, Father, at the airport. Let them have a radical encounter with you right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Let their humility snap back in the name of Jesus Christ. Let every spirit of narcissism in these men die by fire in the name of Jesus. You have mantled us, Father, to destroy the spirit of narcissists. You have mantled us, God, to destroy the spirit of Leviathan, the king of all pride. We declare that it is destroyed by fire in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, these things cannot live in the presence of God. We declare, Father, that just like Saul, you will, Father, restore them. Well, I don't even know if you restored them, restore, restore Saul, God. This how I pray. I don't know if he restores all, but we declare signs, miracles, and wonders. We declare, God, that this is a generation where they say that narcissism cannot be healed. This is the generation that narcissists can be healed. How dare we utter out our mouths, God, that you will not heal narcissism when we are the clay and you are the potter, Father. Who cannot knock this stuff down and rebuild it back up, Father? You are God that will mar this ugly clay and build it back up to what you need it to be, Father. Never again will we speak against what is possible for you, God. You are maker. You are creator, Father. You are author and finisher, oh Lord. If you can't do it, it will not be done. Let this be a token. Let this be evidence, Father. Let this be a sign, miracle, and wonder. That every man that we see in our lives because of this fast and prayer, we will see the spirit of narcissism completely destroyed off of this man's life. We will see the spirit of rejection that this spirit of narcissism is rooted from healed in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, pray over our men. Father, clothe them with a garment of humility in the name of Jesus Christ. Clothe these men with a garment of humility, Father. We destroy the garment of pride. We destroy the garment of haughtiness. We destroy the, guard the garment of stubbornness. We destroy the garment of rebellion. We destroy the garment of perversion and lust. We destroy the garment of suicide. We destroy the garment of losing their mind. Father, we destroy, set these garments on fire in the name of Jesus Christ. And we declare, Father, that they are mantled. They are garmented, God. They have a new wardrobe of the spirit of humility in the name of Jesus Christ. Whatever you need to do, God, to bring these men down to their knees in humility, God. Tear them down now. Break them down now, God every counterfeit wall that they have over them, God, to keep them protected. Every counterfeit angel, God, that is sitting on guard over these men to keep them protected. Break it down in the name of Jesus. Lord Jehovah Sabaoth, God of the angel armies, send your angels right now to war against every counterfeit gatekeeper over their hearts right now, Father. Tear it down today in the name of Jesus. Knock those walls down today, Father, in the name of Jesus. Let those walls come crumbling down today, in the name of Jesus Christ, Father, I pray, God, no man on this earth, God, is too far that you cannot reach them. Spirit of the living God, let these men have an encounter with you today in the name of Jesus Christ. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, Father. Today in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on. Pray over your men. Pray over the men. We cover, I cover my son, God, with the blood of Jesus Christ. I cover Pop Father in the name of Jesus Christ. From the top of his head to the very soles of his feet, I declare that my son will not struggle with the demons of his father. I declare that my son will not struggle with the demons of my father, Father. But in the name of Jesus, my son has a spirit of purity. My son has the only true and living God living on the inside of him. My son will be marked by generational blessings because I am a repairer of the breach. My son is a great husband to his wife. My son is a great father to his children. My son is a great leader in his community. My son is an accurate prophet and one that is marked by his integrity and good character and wisdom of God. I declare in the name of Jesus Christ that my son will not be marked by a scandal, but my son, God, will be marked by the integrity of the Holy Ghost. I declare over Pop, Father, in the name of Jesus, that he is a mighty man of valor on this earth today, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Christ. Thank you that just like prophet Samuel, God, you are training him up even at his young age, oh Lord. And I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that nothing that he says falls dead to the ground and bears any fruit. Come on, pray over your daughter. Mad men has no gender. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray over my daughter, God. I declare, Father, oh, in the name of Jesus Christ that you turn her every which way but loose. I thank you, Father, that she falls more in love with you over and over again, not because I'm in love with you, but because she has her own encounter with you. I thank you for the gift of wisdom that resides on the inside of her father. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for the man that she marries is a great man of God that will honor and protect her all the days of her life. Father, I thank you, Father, that she is grace to be his wife, that she has the wisdom to be his wife. Come on, pray for your children. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus that my children are surrounded by the fire of God, according to Zechariah 2, 5. I thank you, Father, that my children are impenetrable against any attack of the enemy. In the name of Jesus Christ, a wall of fire protects our children. I declare that my children are the apple of your eye, Father. I declare, God, that anything that is trying to be birthed into this war, in this world, God, anybody that is pregnant right now with a child in their womb sent by the devil to try to attack my children. Let them miscarry now in the name of Jesus Christ. Let that demon baby miscarry now in the name of Jesus Christ. I declare, Father, that my children are protected. The mantle, the covenant, the altar that you have made with us, that we are covered by God. We are covered by God. Come on, pray over your spouse. Father, in the name of Jesus, I cover my husband with the blood of Jesus Christ. I cover my husband, Father. Let the angels of the Lord keep guard over my husband, Father. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke every spirit of perversion. I rebuke every spirit of polygamy. I rebuke every spirit of adultery off of my marriage in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father, that my husband fears the Lord. I thank you that my husband honors the covenant that you have made with us, Father. I thank you, Father, that my husband is so afraid of you, God, that he literally only wants to do right by me, oh Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you, Father, that you are a wall of fire round about my husband. I thank you, Father, that my husband has the wisdom of God. I thank you, Father, that my husband is my king, my priest, and my prophet in the house, and my pastor. I thank you in the name of Jesus that you have given him the wisdom that he needs in this hour. Father, I plead the blood of Jesus over his mind. I plead the blood over his thought process. I plead the blood over his emotions. I plead the blood over how he makes decisions for the family. I plead the blood of Jesus over it, God. I pray in the name of Jesus that you put the right people around my husband. Let the right counsel be around my husband. For you said in the multitude of counsel, oh Lord, there is safety. Father, in the name of Jesus, any soul tie that my husband has to any woman, any soul tie that my husband has to any region, any soul tie that my husband has to any organization, let it break now in the name of Jesus. Any ungodly soul tie that my husband has to any woman, any ungodly organization, any person, God, that is hindering or delaying anything, Father, let that soul tie be broken now in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, I declare that you will restore his soul according to Psalms 23, 3, Father. Restore the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions of my husband in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, let's pray against the spirit of suicide. Father, in the name of Jesus, we declare that the we declare a ceasefire against the spirit of suicide, Father, in the name of Jesus over our men. We declare a ceasefire fire, God, over, over the spirit of suicide, God. We rebuke the spirit of suicide. We command you to be cast into the abyss. We seal you there. We bind you there with the blood of Jesus Christ. Anybody that is suicidal, I want y'all to know is usually homicidal. Anybody that is suicidal is usually homicidal. So Father, we declare over ourselves that we are at the right place at the right time, engaged in the right activities. Father, because we are covered by the blood of Jesus, because we are covered by God and the covenant that you made with us. Father, we declare right now in the matchless name of Jesus Christ that we are in the right place at the right time, doing the right things. Whoever is on the way to kill us, whoever is on the, if we're going to the grocery store and there is a madman waiting there, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, let them repent or face your judgment and justice before they get to us in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, pray about, Father, I pray that the blood of Jesus rolls out in front of us like a red carpet, God. I pray, God, that the blood of Jesus rolls out in front of us like a red carpet. I declare, God, that the enemy will not be able to trace or track us in the realm of the spirit or even in the natural. Anybody that is trying to kill you right now that you don't 
don't even know about because they have lost their mind. I declare that even in that moment they repent or in that moment they lose their life in the name of Jesus, but your life will not be touched. I declare in the name of Jesus that there will not be a madman that touches the school of any child you go to. I declare in the name of Jesus that there will not be a madman that touches the daycare of any baby that you own. In the name of Jesus, I declare that there will not be a madman at an airport waiting for you. I declare that there will not be a madman in any country that you go to that is waiting for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, order our steps, O Lord. Your word says that the, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. We declare that our steps are ordered, Father. Course correct us, redirect us. If we are on our way somebody um, somewhere and a madman is waiting for us, redirect our steps, O Lord, according to Psalms 37, 23. In the name of Jesus Christ, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he will delight in his way. In the name of Jesus Christ. Father, in this hour, I pray that you would increase our gift of discerning of spirits. Heighten us, God. Strengthen us, Father. Grow it, God. Let us grow in the gift of discerning of spirits, God. Not just in regular discernment. The gift of discerning of spirits. Let us discern a spirit operating behind somebody, Father. If anybody should not have our children, let it, the, the gift of discerning of spirits make us so uneasy. Let it vex us so much that we will not hand our children over to somebody because we don't, we can't, we can't understand what we sense. Father, in the name of Jesus, this is not the day for that. Okay. The next prayer point, let's kill our idols. Go ahead, open up your mouth and kill an idol. Your idol is anything you love more than your obedience to God. Your idol is anything that you love more than your obedience to God. What does that mean? That means that God has promised us marriage. God has said that this is going to be the year of the bride. We should have hope in that, right? You should have high expectation in that. But anytime that promise or that hope has turned into a golden calf and you now start worrying about it, you have now turned that thing into idolatry. Um, worship is worship to the devil. Worry, worry, I'm sorry. Worry is actually worship to the devil. Worry is worship to the devil. So anytime you now are worrying about something, you are actually worshiping the enemy, right? And so that is how you know that you've turned from, that is how you know you've walked away from the promise being something that God gave you and you have hope in and the promise now being a golden calf and you have now, um, put that thing on a pedestal above God because your hope should not be in that promise God gave you. Your hope should be in God, the promise maker. My hope is not in the man. Your hope is not in the man or the woman. Your hope is not in if they do right. Your hope is not in if they hear. Your hope is not in them. They're just a regular person. Your trust is not in them. Your expectation that they do right is not in them. Your expectation is in the promise giver. Your expectation is in the promise maker. Your expectation is in the promise keeper. So anytime you realize that you put your hope in a person and you took your hope off of God, you are now in idolatry. Father, the Bible says that God is a jealous God. Deuteronomy 4.24 says, for the Lord thy God is a consumer me fire, even a jealous God. The Bible says in Exodus 34, 14, for thou shalt worship no other God, lowercase g, for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. This lets us know that God is a jealous God. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we repent for the spirit of idolatry. We repent for being an idolatrous people, Father. We repent, God, for serving other gods. We repent, Father. We ask that you forgive us for spiritual adultery. We repent, Father, for wherever we walked away from you. We repent, God, for wherever we walked away from you, our bridegroom, and decided to serve another God, whether that was in the area of um, a man or a woman or a job or ministry, God, in any type of way, any area of our life, God, that we have allowed it to pri be prioritized over you, God. We ask that you forgive us. Open up your mouth and begin to repent for idolatry, God. We repent for idolatry, Father. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, everybody under the sound of my voice, God, that you would increase them in a higher level of conviction. We heard the word of the Lord that you said that you are coming after our idols today and people will begin to drop dead. Father, in the name of Jesus. I pray that you will put us in a prophetic Goshen, that it will not touch us, Father. I pray, Father, that we will be every single day. We will be conscious to not make anything an idol. We will be conscious not to make any promise that you gave to us an idol. We will be conscious not to make the, the thing that has manifested in the beautiful gift that you've given us an idol, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, we repent for idolatry, God. We pray that the spirit of idolatry is uprooted out of our hearts, out of our bloodlines. Father, we, we just 
We uproot any altar, God, that was erected to any idol. We destroy it by fire in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, we declare right now over our life that every idol is dead. Every idol is broken. Come on, kill it. Anything that's become an idol, put it on the altar, kill it dead. Any desire that you wanted that's become an idol, kill it dead, Father. Anything that we have made an idol that has become an enemy against you, Father, kill it. Kill it now in the name of Jesus. I'd rather you kill it than you kill me. Kill it now, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Kill it now, Father. Kill it now, Father. Kill it now in the name of Jesus Christ. I know, God, that when I get it back together, come on, speak to him. I know now when we get it back together, God, you are more than willing to resurrect this thing, God, because you specialize in resurrecting the dead back to life again. But Father, if anything in my life, anything in our life, God, has become an idol to you, Father, destroy it now in the name of Jesus for the sake of my soul, Father. Anything, anything, lay it at the altar. Come on, lay it at the altar. Anything that's become an idol, Father, destroy it out of our lives right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And we know, Father, that anything that we kill as a sacrifice on this altar, Father, you are more than willing to resurrect in your timing when you see fit, God, when you know that this thing will not be an enemy against you and we will not become enemies against you for our bloodline. Thank you for the mercy of even showing us that we needed to repent for it. Thank you for the mercy of giving us another day to repent for it. And we thank you, Father, that we stop today with a clean slate with you in the name of Jesus Christ. And we declare, we make a vow to you today that we will wor worship before we worry. We make a vow to you today that we will worship before we worry. And I just want to thank God for being author and finisher of our faith. God is a beautiful God. What I love about um, God being the author and the finisher of our faith, which means is if God has given you a promise, y'all, if God has given you a promise, God is not, we, we start things and don't finish them. Like we're very like that. But that's not how God is. God doesn't start things that he doesn't finish. And the fact that he is named author and finisher of our faith means that what God has started in our life, he is finishing. So please don't think that because you haven't seen anything take place, nothing's happening. I'm telling you, we are breaking ground right now. We are laying foundation. When it's time to build and plant, y'all are going to see a speed on this fast. Like never, God is going to show signs, miracles, and wonders with this speed. We will be, God is going to astound us with what God is doing in this, in this life. And I also want you to keep note, the Bible says, Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible, right? When I looked up the word impossible, this is for those of you that think that somebody is so far gone that, you know, it can't happen. The word impossible means, one of the definitions means very difficult to deal with. And it also means of a person who is unreasonable, um, difficult, wayward. The word wayward means madman. When he says nothing is impossible, that means that that madman you're praying about, that person you're praying about, that is not impossible for God. It might be impossible for you, but it's not impossible for God. And I'm, I'm going to leave you with this. Job 42.10. This is what I know for sure. Job 42.10. Catch this revelation and I pray y'all listen to me when I say do this. The Bible says, after Job interceded for his friends... God restored his fortune and then doubled it. We hear that word restoration again. After Job interceded for his friends, God restored his fortune. We got the word restoration again and then doubled it. That lets us know that something different happens when we intercede for other people. So please, I'm begging you all, continue to intercede for our men. We are going to see more men in our churches taking their rightful place. If you are connected with Covered by God, which is my ministry, we are bold women, we are powerful women, and we are not feminist women. We believe that men have their rightful places in our lives as husbands, and, um, and we know what those places are, but we do not usurp the authority of men. We do not emasculate our men. Uh, we are submissive to our men and submission is power. Once you really do a real study on submission, it's not you being a doormat or you being docile and being run over by a man who is just a drunk with power. That's not what that means at all. But we are not a feminist women. We are women that um, are excited about a man being the head in, in our house and, um, and, and us submitting to our husbands as we submit both one to another. That's what we are. Another praise report. 
So uh, we fast for the first three days of every single month. And I don't know if you guys remember, but we prayed for two people. We prayed for baby Shekinah Glory, uh, who the doctor said she had leukemia and was not letting her go home. And uh, we also prayed for Mrs. Edith Oraka, who uh, was on oxygen, doing pretty not okay, and the doctors wouldn't let her go home. Uh, they Both of those people were nowhere near going home. We fasted, we prayed for three days on the first through the third. We turned on our plate, thousands of us interceded. Baby, they both got let home the next day. Y'all can't tell me that, I, I don't care what nobody say about prayer and fasting. The ministry of prayer and fasting is powerful. To God be all of the glory. We got a prayer. We got many prayers answered, but I wanted to share that. Y'all, these people were nowhere near going home. They were not letting. But I told God, I said, the baby name should kind of glory. You know what I'm saying? Like you can't, you can't. So Shekinah and Mrs. Edith Araka both were let out of the hospital they are um, both home. They are out of the hospital. This could have only been God. This could have only been the hand of God. This could only be God. So thank you all for your prayers. And let me leave you with this really quickly because I want to leave you with like, you know, I'm sure you got a lot of homework assignments with the scriptures I gave, but I want to leave you with what, what, your, uh, what your strategy is next, right? This is your strategy. Jeremiah 33 verses 11, he says, I'm going to restore this. I'm going to restore your bloodline back to you. I'm going to restore your life. I'm going to restore your family back. Right. And it looks desolate right now. It don't look like nothing's happening right now. Your womb still looks barren. Your finances still look barren. Your prospect for a husband or wife still looks barren. Right. But there's going to be a voice of joy, voice of gladness, voice of bridegroom, voice of the bride, the voice of them that shall say, praise the Lord of hosts for the Lord is good and his mercy endureth forever. And of them shall bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. For I will cause to return the captivity of the land. I will cause to return the captivity of the land. I will cause to return the captivity of the land. I will cause to return the captivity of the land. Whoa, that sounds familiar. Job 42, 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. So here, listen to what I'm saying to y'all. This is our, this is your strategy for this week. We need our captivity turned. According to Job 42, 10, one way that the captivity gets turned is interceding for somebody else. And the second way that your captivity is turned, according to Jeremiah 33, Verse 11 is the sacrifice of praise. So your homework assignment, if you will, your, your next warfare strategy is intercession for somebody else. Because I want you to read Job 42, 10 in every version you can find. Every version has something that's a little more lit than the other version. It's so exciting. And then I want you to read Jeremiah 33, 11. God is restoring our captivity and your strategy is intercession for somebody else. While you're praying for yourself, you're going to intercede for other people and you're also going to give God the sacrifice of praise. This means that you are worshiping God. You are praising God, God that cannot lie, God that can never fail, God that it doesn't matter what it looks like right now, Father, if you said it, it has to happen, right? You're like a little girl. You're like a little boy that is like, my dad said it, like my daddy said it. He's going to bring me, he's going to take me to the amusement park. My dad said it. My daddy said it. If he said it, it has to happen, right? So the sacrifice of praise, I don't care what, like, what the enemy is going to do this week is try to get on your nerves, bother you real bad, really upset you about a few things. Don't fall for it. Do not fall for it. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. I want you to see it with your spiritual eye and say, you know what? I know exactly what this is. I'm not wrestling up against flesh and blood. I'm recognizing against, I'm fighting against a spirit. Don't even let the spirit bother you because that's when you know your breakthrough is right around the corner. Some of you are like, Tiffany, I started fasting and all hell is breaking loose. Let me say this to you and listen to me carefully. All hell was already breaking loose. You couldn't see it because you were looking at everything with your natural eye. So if you started fasting with us at Covered by God and all of a sudden all hell is breaking loose, 
hear what I'm saying to you. All hell has always been breaking loose. God has just opened up your spiritual eyes that was blinded. And now you can see what the enemy was doing. And now because you can see it, you're able to say, oh, I didn't know that's going on. I didn't know that was going on. I didn't know that was going on. Let me break this stuff in prayer and fasting. Let me destroy this stuff in prayer and fasting. Let me kill this stuff in prayer and fasting. That is what you're doing. You see what I'm saying? This stuff didn't just pop up. It was already there. It was lying dormant. And because you're fasting and what fasting does is it brings up to the top everything that that's wrong with you. This is why when people start fasting, maybe their face breaks out, your tongue turns white, maybe you have body odor, like you feel dizzy, you feel nauseous. Why? Because your body is going through a healing crisis. And so all of these toxic things in your system that was lying dormant, waiting for five years from now to create disease in your body, God is like, because you decided to fast, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this stuff that was rooted in your body to create disease. I'm going to make it come up now. So that nauseousness you feel, the dizziness you feel, the headaches, the migraines you're having, the breaking out of your face, your um, body odor and all of that. Y'all, that is sign that something was in your body trying to kill you 10 years from now. And because you decided to sacrifice, because you decided to pray and fast, God is literally making that stuff come up to the top so that it can be dealt with. Fasting is so powerful for your body. It is literally God's natural surgery system for your body without having to go under the knife. And so I love you all. I hope I didn't forget anything. Um, please go, I don't know, uh, follow me on Instagram. I guess that's what I'll tell you to do. Follow me on Instagram at Tiffany Montgomery. And please make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. What I'm going to post next it, it, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. Uh, many of you have had an abortion. And if you had an abortion, you made a covenant, a demonic covenant with a demon named Moloch. You made a demonic covenant with a demon named Moloch. Give me one second. Pop. Subscribe or post notifications so you never miss her videos. Oh, thank you. Because you're the YouTube guru. Tell them one more time, Pop, please. Like I said, subscribe to her YouTube channel with post notifications to get every single upload she makes thank you i'm so glad you knew that youtube guru i, I just literally just showed them on the stairs oh well, thank you i'm so glad that the holy ghost told you to remind everybody that that's so good um but when you have an abortion and that blood is shed you make um you make a covenant with a demon named moloch and uh and that is why your life is what it is. It's literally, you've opened up the door to the spirit of death over your life. Uh, but because we serve a gracious, merciful God, uh, there you can pray, you can, you can destroy that, excuse me, you can destroy that covenant, you can break that covenant, and you can be free from that covenant. So I do have a video on that, and I will post it, I would say tonight, but I have to teach a class tonight. Um... I have to teach a class tonight, so it's gonna, it's gonna have to be tomorrow. So I will post it tomorrow, but I'll let you all know what time so we can all just watch it together. Um, but I love you all to life and uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel and do everything Pop said for y'all to do. Post notifications. Mwah. Post notifications, bye guys.